Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dallas Nevins, and I want to thank you in advance for participating in this month's webinar. As some of you may know, we are providing complimentary webinars on a monthly basis that feature a variety of talent management topics. The topic of today's webinar is Leaking Pay and Performance, Driving a Culture that Rewards Top Talent. Our presenter today is Barbara McIntosh, Talent Management Consultant here at TalentQuest. Before we get started, I wanted to let you all know that due to the large number of participants, we have muted the phone lines. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom right hand of the online webinar. We will answer any questions at the end of the presentation. One final item is that we will be sending all participants the slideshow and audio of this webinar by the end of the week. Thank you again for your participation, and now I will turn the presentation over to Barbara. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Dallas mentioned, as we go through the presentation, please, please feel free to enter in any questions that you have in the question area of the webinar. And if we can't get to them during the presentation, we will try to address them at the end of the presentation. So today we're going to be talking about paying for performance, really focusing on pay, not just from a cash standpoint, but also looking at from a total rewards perspective. Since we, we know in the total rewards model, compensation is a large piece of that, both cash compensation, but also benefits, as well as work-life balance and schedules, performance and recognition programs, low monetary rewards, non-monetary rewards, and then developmental and career opportunities. So when we think about developing a, a total rewards model, we want to take into account the culture of the organization as well as the business strategy, knowing that that's going to ideally drive our human capital or human resources strategy. Then once that total rewards model is developed, ideally it's going to be done so, so that it's going to attract, motivate, and retain the caliber of talent that we need to drive the business results. Right. But this is an interesting time, and we have recently, in the last couple of years, experienced um, some some very unusual, in the last you know decade or so, unusual economic conditions that have put us into a state where organizations are challenged by not having or struggling to maintain effective and affordable attraction, selection, retention, and engagement strategies. With low salary budgets, no salary budgets, um, organizations freezing salaries at a level that we've never seen, um, we're really experiencing challenges today as human resources and compensation professionals, professionals to try to reward our employees, differentiate um, the, the pay, as well as to encourage and motivate retention as the market starts to turn. Specifically, we're having a difficult time attracting and retaining high potential employees. So as we, we know and we hear, as the market continues to hopefully, the economic conditions continue to hopefully improve and more organizations are able to extend additional resources to the employee population, we're going to lose potentially our high performers and our top performers before we're gonna lose the rest of the population. So it's gonna be the best of the best that goes first. In addition, we have a number of jobs out there that have critical skills, and we have a low supply for them in the market, but a high demand for them. So those positions as well are going to be our, going to be our most vulnerable. We've also got a population of employees that have been working more and experiencing higher levels of stress than we have ever seen. So employees are not only working harder, but with these leaner organizations having gone through layoffs and um, you know, workforce reductions, we're seeing that employees are wearing multiple hats. And there are many times those are, those are our top performers and our top employees that are wearing those multiple hats. If we lose those employees, we're losing multiple functions. And in many cases, they're not jobs that are very easy to fill and walk into because these individuals have had a large span um, of influence over what used to be multiple positions. So that in itself becomes a challenge. We're not only losing that talent, but we could also potentially have a very difficult time um, having somebody kind of close that learning curve. This is a study that was done by Towers Watson. It's their 2012 Global Workforce Study. And what they asked participants to do um, was to note the top five drivers of attraction, retention, and engagement. And what they found is, as you can see, ranked one, two, three, four, and five across attraction, retention, and engagement. 
In attraction and retention, two out of the three areas for the focus of the study, base pay and salary, was listed as the number one driver. Okay, so for both attraction and retention. So when we talk about, well, pay is not everything, it's not everything, but clearly base salaries are very important or perceived as very important to employees. And when you think about it, in this state, and having gone through um, the financial and economic crisis that we have recently gone through, banks are not going to be looking or taking into account variable pay. They're really only going to be looking at base salary when people are applying for loans or mortgages. So there's a lot more weight on that fixed pay component. Um, that being said, in engagement, you see that base pay and salary did not rank as being one of the top five drivers. So interestingly, it is in attracting and retaining employees, but once employees are there and they're engaged, it's not as important of a factor to increase that engagement. Okay. Another thing to consider when trying to decide um, whether it's worth investing the time and or the resources in really developing a pay for performance culture is the impact that it's going to have on top performers. Top performers historically are more attracted to organizations that do recognize and reward performance. So if they, if you're trying to attract a high level or high caliber employee population, one thing to think about is if you're able to show them that that is part of your culture, they're going to be more attracted to your organization than one that's not going to differentiate pay based on performance because there are they are top performers they have historically been top performers so naturally they're going to be attracted to an organization that's going to recognize and reward that conversely um, not only is it a, is it a, a rewarding environment for them but it can be a very demotivating envi environment for them if there is no pay differentiation because they're going to lose motivation so you might not be able to get all that you can out of that population if you're not differentiating now that we have systems and software out there that can help us to automate our performance management processes, our goals management processes, as well as the reporting that can come along with that and accompany that, um, specifically how it can be used in the calibration of performance ratings, it's less of an administrative burden for organizations to take on these types of practices with that link the pay performance for performance. So historically, when companies were looking at spreadsheets um, to try to calibrate ratings across managers to ensure that there was um, an equitable process where pay and performance were linked, now we've got a much easier process for those in organizations that are engaging in automated performance management and goals management software. And the last point is salary budgets are finally on the rise. Findings have shown that in 2013, we are going to rise to that 3% mark. Um, if, for those of you that follow this type of statistic, in 2009, we hit the all-time low with, with some reporting as low as 1.89% on average. Um, so finally, we're, we're seeing not only that organizations are increasing their budgets so they have more to work with when it comes to differentiating pay, because we know that that has been a great challenge, and one of the reasons that companies have not in the last couple of years been differentiating pay is because they felt like they didn't have enough money to do that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But also, fewer companies are reporting freezes. This is a... a a chart that comes from a study done by Culpepper, their salary budget and compensation planning survey. And what it shows was that in 2009, that same year that we saw that historical low of about 1.89% for salary budgets, we also saw that the number of organizations that were reporting no increase um, or, or freezing their salaries spiked up to 37% which is extremely high. And what we found then was that that also changed how we look at that reporting statistic for salary increases because where many times people had relied on the average knowing that there might only be three to four percent of organizations that were including zeros in those averages, that year we had a third or over a third of the population of the employees that were, or the organizations that were reporting into that statistic that were zeros. So the average salary budget increase was significantly lower than the median um, because organizations that were continuing to increase were doing so at a 2 to 3 percent level. But when you included in all those zeros, that's when you saw numbers drop down to about 1.89 percent. 
Okay, so we saw that number decrease to 13.9% of organizations freezing salaries in 2010, and then it was steady around 4.5% for 2011 and 2012, but it's projected to go back down to more normal levels of 2% in uh, 2013. Okay, just some other salary budget increase statistic findings and projections. According to World at Work's most recent survey, um, if you look at the, the, the metro areas that have the lowest and highest increase percentages, um, actual increase percentages in 2012, Detroit was the lowest, with a, showing an average of 2.6%, and Houston, Texas was the highest, with 3.1%. So even our highs and our lows are, are still very, very close together, with, with the range only being 26 to 3.1%. When we look at projected 2013 by industry, public administration is the lowest. Um, they are, are still very low with 1.3 um, to 1.6, depending on your source, percent increase um, projected for that population. Arts, entertainment, and recreation was higher, uh, one of the highest um, next to mining. Mining was 4%, and that arts, entertainment, and recreation was about 3.5%. Other industries, information, technology is also somewhere around that 3.3 um, to 3.4%. But mining is the, the first industry to pop above um, the 3.5% the to go as far as 4%. Okay. So again, why do we need to differentiate? There was a study by McKinsey and Company, the War for Talent, that was done in 2000. And the reason for this study was to try to understand the contributions that our high performers give us um, versus average performers. So these are high performers versus average, not high performers versus low. And what that study found was very, very interesting. Found that if you look across different types of roles, you'll find that on average, top performers um, produce a lot more than our average performers. So in operation roles, they were using productivity as the metric to try to quantify the contributions of those employees. And what they found was that top performers or our high performers were 40% more productive than average performers. When we looked at general management roles, the metric changed to profit. And we found that our high performers were 49% more profitable than our average performers or had 49% or drove 49% of a greater profit than average performers. And then when we look at sales roles, this is where you really see the differentiation between top and average. 67% more revenue was generated by sales roles than average performers. Okay, so 40 to 67% more in terms of contribution. Conversely, we typically don't pay our high performers um, more than 20% than more than that of an average performer. So the return on our investment for the contribution that they're giving us um, and what we're actually investing in them as it relates to our average population, um, it's pretty huge. So less than 20% is typically what we see given to our high group uh, versus our, our low group. On the flip side, the cost of replacing a top performer is much more than an average performer. So when we think about turnover, we think about the cost of turnover. If we're turning over a position and we're turning over somebody in that position that's an average performer, it's probably going to have a lot less of an impact um, fiscally on that role than if that person was a top performer. If you remember, in the, in the beginning of the presentation, I talked to the fact that we're going to be most at risk in this um, in this economy and this work environment to lose our top performers. So the impact that that could have from a cost standpoint as it relates to turnover could be very, very significant. Okay, according to another recent study, two-thirds of organizations do report a formal process for identif identifying high potentials. However, less than 40% of these actually inform the employees of their status. And this is also interesting, and one of the things that I know organizations struggle with sometimes is how to communicate these types of pay for performance initiatives. Do they tell the population um, who has been determined or identified as high potential, or should they kind of keep that behind the scenes because they don't want other employees to be discouraged? Well, what studies would show from a motivation standpoint is, again, employees like to know that they have been identified and that their contributions are being 
um, rewarded, or at least being recognized, even if rewards are not tied to them. So as a best practice, it's probably a good idea to let those employees in some way know that they have been recognized as high performers. And it isn't, the one-size-fits-all approach um, is not going to always be the most effective. So as we're seeing organizations increase their salary budgets and have more money to differentiate pay, they need strategies for holding on to their, the best of the best, you've got to pr promote that high-performance culture. Um, you do need to balance internal equity with the business needs, obviously but everybody may not get a trophy. We all know um, if we've read any sort of social articles on the, the trophy pop, or the trophy culture that we've driven, all the kids get a trophy, um, it really brings to question, is that the best approach? Is giving everybody a, 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 the same amount of increase really going to be the best approach, or are we just going to be um, compounding issues that already exist by doing so? Let's stop for a second and, um, and take a poll, kind of going back to salary budget increases. I want to see um, what you guys are doing and what your organization is doing or budgeted, has budgeted for 2013 for increases. So you should see a poll pop up on your screen. When you get an opportunity to, um, just select what your organization is budgeting for salary increases in 2013. There's a few more seconds. Okay. So as you can see, it's similar to the, the study that, um, that I noted earlier in World at Work's finding as well as Culpepper and other organizations that report these types of statistics. A majority of you are somewhere in that 2.6 to 3% range, um, which, is, which is not surprising given that's what the the organization have reported. Okay, great. Okay, so we're going to kind of walk through some different ways that you can develop compensation programs to tie to different levels of performance. And the first that we're going to talk about is, is base pay differentiation, because going back to some of the findings, um, what drives employees from a retention as well as a um, attraction standpoint, we know that base pay is a huge driver. There's a lot of weight that employees put on that component of compensation and total rewards. So knowing that it's a key driver of attraction and retention, there are ways for organizations to distribute merit increases or salary budget increases based on employee performance. One way that they can do that is to, to not include any sort of salary range information. So if you're not using a traditional salary range um, or salary structure, you might just say, based on your performance rating, if you are a 1, you don't get an increase, 2, you might get... 0.5% increase if you are, you know, looking at somebody that still is developing in the role, 3, um, 2%, 4, 4%, 5%, 5%, okay? Another way that you can do it, though, that helps to ensure that you're taking into account not only performance, but also the internal equity of positions as well as the external market of positions, if you've got a salary structure that has been developed and the ranges are set at a particular level in the market where you as an organization are targeting um, the market. So let's say your, your structure is set at the median of the market for other industries similar to you in your geographic area. If you've structured it that way and your positions are slotted within those ranges such that those are the positions that are paid similarly in the market and also seen as similar from an internal equity standpoint, that's how they're grouped, then when you look at the compa ratio zone or you look at the quartile of where employees are falling within that range, you can also alter your percentage increases, the recommended percentage increases, not only on performance but also by position within the range. The idea behind this methodology is that if you have very, very top performers in the lower end of your range, you're probably going to want to allocate more dollars to that population than if you've got that same level of performers higher in the range. Okay, And the reason is, if you have people high within your range, theoretically, those individuals are being paid very well as it relates to market. 
So even though they are top performers, you might choose not to give them no increase. You might give them a spot or give them a bonus or make up what the merit increase would be in a one-time bonus. You're really most at risk of losing those top performers that are not paid as competitively and are at the lower end of your range. So what you're looking at here is a performance ma matrix that takes into position in the range where you see first quartile, second quartile, third and fourth quartile, as well as their performance rating. And you can see that lower in the range, we've allocated more dollars, um, and the higher your performance rating is, the higher those percentage amounts are. So this becomes a communication issue, and it becomes something that needs to be communicated not only to the employee population, but also managers need to be trained on having those conversations, because there are going to be situations where you have employees that are at the same level of performance, but they get different percentage of increase based on where they are within their range. What happens, though, is over time, this approach is going to help you correct any internal equity issues that you may have. Whereas if you decide to give the same performance rating to that individual low in the range and that individual high in the range, or same increase to those individuals, you're just going to be compounding the fact that you have that dispersion in pay even though they're at the same performance level. Okay, another strategy to budget for ensuring that you have dollars to allocate towards your top performers is just to carve, simply carve out a portion of your salary budget for a group that you determine to be top performers. So in this example, you might have a 3% salary budget increase, which is in line with the average for the national, uh, the national market across all industries. If you take just 0.5% of that and carve it out for, let's say, your top 25 performers. You may decide it's the top 20 performers, 20% you, performers. You may say it's the top 15% performers, but let's just use top 25 for this example. The top performer average increase can be 4.5%, where the remaining 75% of the population, their average increase can be 2.5%. So even though we're only looking at a 3% budget, we're able to pay at least about one and, a half per, one and a half times our top performers more than our average performer population. And if you remember, in terms of what they're contributing, it's a lot larger than that. But even this amount of, of differentiation um, can allow for us to demonstrate that we are really rewarding performance. So we're going to move on from base pay and talk about short-term incentive. Short-term incentives are any incentives that are based on performance periods for um, one year or less. So these are going to be uh, bonuses, quarterly bonuses, any sort of annual incentive payout, but it's, it's not going to be long-term incentives. We're really talking about short-term incentives here. One way that you can do this that's sort of the, the probably the most simplistic way if you've never had any sort of variable pay program is to tie it to some company financial performance metric. So it sort of becomes um, a little bit um, like a, um, you know, a shared, just a shared program where everybody, if the performance, if the company performs at a certain level, hits a certain revenue, EBITDA target, then everybody gets um, a bonus. The problem with this is for some employees, um, this kind of profit sharing type plan, there's not a lot of of, of line of sight. So they might not understand how their behavior or their performance or increasing their performance is really going to drive this metric. So where this much be, might be much more clearly aligned at the top of the house with your executive level employees, when you go further down, especially with some of those individual contributors that don't have a lot of control um, over those types of, of large scale um, performance metrics, they might not do anything different than what they have been doing because they don't see how they could impact that. What you can start to do, though, is you can start to look at taking those metrics and putting business unit department goals around those or linking employees themselves to key metrics such as customer satisfaction, customer retention, or customer support. Another practice that is, is relatively low in cost as it relates to some, um, some other types of short-term incentive programs, but can have a huge impact um, in terms of motivation, retention, as well as performance employees, are spot bonuses. And what spot bonuses are, 
they're rel relatively low cost, but they can have a high impact because if a manager gives an employee a bonus, let's say that employee has just completed um, an extremely impactful project. They did it in a short period of time. They were under the gun um, because of, of the needs of the business, not because they were procrastinating. The manager can say, you did a great job. You know, Sam, that was absolutely fantastic. Here's 500 bucks. Um, enjoy. And it happens very, very close to the time that the behavior was, that the behavior happened. Um, and it can have, even though it's not a $3,000 at the end of your bonus, it really shows the employee that one, they were recognized, and two, that the manager sort of gone out of their way to financially um, reward them for that. So what can, what many organizations will do is they will give their their managers a spot, a quarterly spot bonus budget and, um, you know, give them direction around what sort of activities would constitute different levels of, of bonus or bonus amounts. And they might have to go um, get approval at a higher level if they want to exceed certain amounts for certain, excuse me, certain things. But this can be a really, really good way to um, start to integrate pay for performance into your culture. So we're talking about short-term incentives. If, if we look at long-term incentive pay, long-term incentive pay can not only drive performance, but it also can drive retention because there is time that is tied to the achievement of particular performance goals. Another thing that we see as we have um, more HIPO programs being developed um, and as we're working with clients that are really wanting to um, not only identify their hypos and develop them, but also retain that group of, of really critical employees and, and human capital talent, is that they may tie programs um, to those employees that other employees might not receive. So the important thing here, though, same with any pay for performance program. A pay for performance program is not going to be very good if we don't have confidence in our performance ratings or in how we're defining and differentiating our performance ratings. Similarly, we need to be very clear about how we're defining an organization, um, how we're defining potential. We should be clear of this and have, you know, make sure we have an understanding of this even if we're not tying pay to it, but when we do start tying compensation and rewards programs to that, um, it's, it's critical that, that there's consistency across the organization with how this is being done. And again, it can drive engagement and performance and retention just because of the vesting time in these types of programs. But I, as I did say in the beginning, it's not all about money. There are other ways to pay for rewards or reward for performance. And some of those include developmental activities. And lots of times we'll see those hypo programs tying these sorts of activities um, to them as well. So they might be able to um, become involved in, in a higher level or more development activities, mentor programs. There might be additional tuition reimbursement that's given to employees who reach a certain level of performance. So if you have a performance rating of 4.5% or greater, maybe for that year, you have a budget for tuition reimbursement that is is greater than that of, of perhaps other employees. Or if you reach a performance rating for three years in a row of a certain level, you might be able to um, become eligible for different types of developmental activities, different types of benefits, um, stretch assignments. You might be able to get flexible work schedules or have one day of work to stay at home for that performance period. So there's other things that we can do that we know drive employee engagement as well as retention and attraction, but really specifically engagement um, that don't necessarily involve base, short-term, or long-term incentives. So how do you make it work? You've got to move away. We have to move away from a culture of entitlement. And as many of us know, we have been, for the last number of years, many organizations have been, been giving across the board increases. So we've had a salary budget of 2%. We haven't felt comfortable that that was enough to, to even bother with differentiating. We felt people were already in a bad place. Why do we kick them with, when they're down? Let's just give everybody 2%. As we're starting to see those numbers increase, we're going to have to give some people nothing and some people more if this is the desired direction for our company. And in doing that, we might have to have some difficult conversations with employees that we're used to getting more or used to getting something. Just with any wide um, 
kind of widespread initiative. We've got to have leadership support and engagement. They've got to be heard, and, and the employees have to hear them um, preaching this and, and sort of filtering that through the communication pipeline within the organization. It's crucial to have the technological support so that we can quickly ensure that our ratings are calibrated and have those discussions around calibration as well as reporting and the goal alignment and progress tracking. Market competitiveness and internal equity of the total reward package. If you haven't looked at your rewards package in a while, if you haven't looked at where you are as it relates to the market on your base salary programs, or where you are um, in terms of, of benefits package competitiveness, it's important that you sort of get that baseline before you decide to um, initiate or to, to develop any sort of incentive programs. Because you might have a sense that you're paying um, significantly lower or significantly higher than your, your target market. But in reality, um, once you uh, do that research, you might find that actually um, that's not the case. And that's going to impact your budget. It's also going to impact where you might want to um, allocate those funds. Another thing that you can do as well from a survey standpoint, and some organizations are, are doing sort of total rewards or the total value proposition to employees and, and asking employees not necessarily from a satisfaction standpoint, but what do they value most? and taking the different types of programs that you might already have or might be considering to include um, in your, your total rewards model, they actually, you can survey your employees to find out what they value. Because again, you might think that they value your short, their short-term incentives or their, um, the percentage of mat, the match that they get on the 401k contributions. But we might find something completely different. We might find that they really would rather have more opportunities for um, tuition reimbursement or might want more developmental um, and advancement opportunities. So that's, that's another approach, something that you can do on the front end before you um, actually decide exactly how you're going to set up these, these types of programs. You've got to have effective performance management. Again, you've got to feel really comfortable with that. You've got to train your managers if you haven't done so in a while. If you're, inst if you're instituting a new performance management process, you've got new ratings, and if you're going to tie compensation or reward programs and you have not done so in the past, it's crucial that you have that sort of training. Consistent and frequent performance discussions. It should not be a shock, and it certainly should not be a shock when it's tied to money. Okay, performance rating calibration, again, that's just going to help us understand um, where we are and if we're, if we're skewed towards the positive, then that's going to change what that 4 or what that 5% means. In other words, when we're actually trying to budget our dollars, if we think that if we're working with a normal distribution, thinking that a majority of the population is a 3, and really when our ratings come back, a majority of the population is a 4 or 5, then that's going to impact what our, what our top performers really look like within those groups. And then management training. We've got to teach our managers how to have those difficult conversations, and we also need to try to reduce the amount of rating inflation as well as compression that we've seen. So to wrap it up, really when we're talking about pay for performance or reward for performance, um, be strategic and be creative. This is a time when we can really, um, as organizations, as companies out there, um, make a huge, some decisions that could help us avoid um, huge amounts of, of t potential turnover and losing some of that top talent that's been sitting with us and hanging around with us, but maybe not necessarily as comfortable or as happy with their with their pay for performance packages or with their compensation packages. So you just have to remember people are your biggest asset and you can mix both monetary and non-monetary rewards to make these types of programs work. Okay. Okay, there's a question here. Um, somebody says, my organization has employees in different business units in different areas. Um, one unit might have 60 employees in six locations, but they have one budget for all of them. How do we help the managers move away from across-the-board increases when some of the top performers may be in a different location than poor, for, for poor performers? Um, there'd be nothing for them to compare to. That's a really good question. 
one of the ways that you can do that um, is to try to bring some sort of calibration process to that. So either you need to have um, the different unit managers come together and talk to what the employees are actually doing and why they are quantifying them as to be a top performer if they're not. Um, another thing you can do is you as if you're an HR, your role can be um, one that you can sort of push back a little bit and try to drive that differentiation further if you know that they're not really all the same level of performance. So again, there has to be some sort of either communication across the different locations or some sort of intermediary that can step in, if that's you or if there's somebody else, um, and make sure that, that the top are being identified as top and the low um, perhaps are, are not getting as much of an increase. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm going to turn it back over to Dallas. Thanks, Barbara. And just to let you all know, we'll be sending you a recording of this webinar by the end of the week and if you do have any questions that we weren't able to address today please email them to info at talentquest.com and we will be sure to try to answer them for you and please look forward um, or look for the announcement of our next webinar we hope to have you participate then thank you Barbara and thank you for every to everybody who attended today bye-bye